Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you around the Kamka region and around the world. Uh, welcome to the final session of the Kamka Forum this year. Uh, today's topic is about the education systems uh, of the Kamka countries and to what extent uh, they can adjust to the new labor market demands. Indeed, the, the future of Kamka countries and, and the region uh, as a whole will be shaped significantly by the level of and the, and the quality of education uh, there. So the, those countries that transform the education system that will develop modern and reliable skills will advance and those who lag behind will uh, face uh, further challenges clearly. Now the session uh, today uh, will uh, attempt to address the following questions. Uh, how innovation in education uh, can foster and shape social, economic, and institutional modernization and growth of the Kamka countries? Should educational reforms begin at the top or from the, uh, from the bottom of education systems? How can modern education both reward talent, but also satisfy demands for equity? And also, can existing educational institutions evolve fast enough to provide transforming societies with leaders and workers much needed? And finally, we will discuss to what extent the legislation uh, on education can change fast enough to meet national uh, and also regional demands. So today uh, I have a privilege and honor to uh, join this uh, session as a moderator with uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, we have today uh, Dr. Shams uh, Kasim Laka, uh, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the University of Central Asia. Uh, we have Faris Ismail Zadeh, Executive Vice Rector, ADA University, Azerbaijan. We also have uh, Mr. Hikmat Abdurrahmanov, the CEO and co-founder of Teams University, uh, and also the co-founder of HM Partners, country director, Jen Uzbekistan, also Kamka Network member from, from, from Uzbekistan. We have Talan Sultanov, the co-founder and chair, Kyrgyz chapter of Internet Society, Kamka Network member of Kyrgyzstan, and Dr. Irakli Laitadze, chief financial officer at GMT, um, that's Minda, and lectured at the Ilya State University in Tbilisi, a Kamka Network member from Georgia. So welcome, uh, gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to really uh, share from my perspective, I guess, uh, uh, as a role, uh, to take up the role of the moderator and give some food for thought through uh, a few slides, if you allow me. So can, can we have the slides uh, on, uh, on the screen? Today we will um, talk about the education systems, but how the educa education system is linked to the labor market, which is rapidly uh, changing because of different disruptions, not only the COVID-19, but also the, um, the uh, shocks associated with oil prices and of course disruptions coming from the fourth industrial Revol revolution. Now, when we have the slides on, this, on the screen, I guess, um, can we have the first slide? Thank you. I think the general, general I want to give a general context, I guess, of course, the, the, um, the pandemic and the oil price fluctuations really gave a, a, a strong impetus on the labor markets around the globe, uh, but including, including particularly the Kamka countries. We see um, different countries uh, changing their policies to cope with the uh, with these demands to cope to cope with these challenges. And here um, at White Shield Partners, uh, we also developed a, a couple of years ago the Global Labor Resilience Index uh, that measures uh, basically the uh, the level of resilience of labor markets uh, of 131 countries around the world. And you know, yearly uh, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, we present the results of the annual uh, uh, index. Uh, and last year uh, I was there as well presenting the uh, different countries, including the, the results on uh, Kazakhstan. The uh, um, next slide, please. So within this index, we to, uh, we author this index together with Sir Christopher Pisarides, the Nobel Prize winner uh, for labor economics. So we look at the uh, uh, matter of resilience of labor markets and how education systems and other um, sectors influence the level of resilience to different shocks, to the ability to absorb and, uh, and adapt to different uh, demands as we go along. Next slide, please. 
In terms of the uh, structure of the of the index, uh, why it is important is because we need to look at the different international indicators, and then we know that in the Kamka countries we have issues of the quality of statistics that we are trying to work on. But basically, as just like any other index, uh, indexes, basically the, this uh, global labor resilience index focuses on two things: the structural part and the cyclical part. Structural part consists of the ind uh, indicators related to demography, the country capabilities, macroeconomic stability, the uh, and different vulnerabilities that are not easy to change in the in the short run. On the other hand, we have cyclical pillar uh, co that consists of uh, absorptive and adaptive capabilities and tr transformative capabilities and and issues related to institutions, which I will talk in the next slides. Next slide, please. Now, resilience uh, of the labor market that is inevitably uh, shaped by the quality of uh, education in the common countries uh, can be looked at through different lenses. And here we talk about the dis disruptions that are that require different capabilities depending on the type of disruptions that a country faces. So on this slide, if you can see, number one, uh, the capability is the absorptive capability. The, the capability of a country to absorb the shock I mean, in our case, it's basically COVID-19. It's it's so it is the quality of their social protection and policy, the employment regulations, and labor market inclusiveness. Now, second, the, uh, is the ability of, of a country to adapt to the uh, challenges that the that the crisis uh, brings. So it's basically the flexibility of the economy and the flexibility of the labor market and the effectiveness of different policies to support. Uh, different groups and categories of, of, of labor force. Now, and the third capability is the transformative capability, is the capability of a country to really transform through uh, the, the quality of the ICT infrastructure and different technological solutions to uh, take advantage of the, challenge, uh, of the opportunities that any crisis may bring. Next slide. So here I will not, uh, you know, stop that much. But basically, this index measures not only the, the quantity of jobs, but also the quality of jobs. And then we see that there is a correlation between the labor market resilience and the productivity and employment in the country. Next slide. And yeah, we can skip that slide. Next slide. And of course, uh, in the um, Global indices, we have advanced economies leading, and we have usual suspects like Switzerland, Germany, Netherlands, Singapore. I will not stop uh, on that, but what is to do? What is it to do with the Kamga countries? Where, would you, where do we stand here? So next slide. Next. So in terms of the uh, results for the Kamga countries, we, I think it's important to, to be able to measure because if you can't measure, you can't manage. So of course, any index can be uh, can criticized to, to different degrees and we have issues with statistics, but according to the international uh, organization statistics, this index shows the performance of different countries of the Kamka region uh, in terms of the labor market resilience. We have um, Kazakhstan leading uh, the, the index in the region, followed by Georgia, Azerbaijan and Kyrgyzstan. And uh, there are some um, strengths that we can leverage to really work on these together, especially on, on the education uh, system side. Next, please. Overall, Kamka countries have been progressing over the last five years uh, by 10%, and it's actually above average uh, uh, progress uh, if you're talking about the average uh, growth in the world. I will not we'll go into details, but can we have a next slide? So in terms of the, uh, uh, the country examples like Kazakhstan, uh, it's got strong performance in, in the and then uh, in, in, in number of factors, but more importantly, it has some gaps that should be filled in in the cyclical resilience. So that's to do with the, uh, the issues related to the uh, inequality, uh, issues related to the um, uh, absorptive capabilities. And of course, the, most of the Kamka countries enjoy a, a relatively young population. And of course, that's something that should be leveraged on uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense. Um, next slide. We'll not stop here. Mongolia, and, uh, another example where um, uh, interesting uh, reforms are happening in Mongolia now with new leadership in the country. And we have uh, 
of course, uh, matters of enhancing macroeconomic stability that are influencing the, the stability of the labor market and then its, the, its resilience to the to different shocks. Next slide. Now, uh, I think what is particularly important is, is, is the notion of the uh, future skills. Edu education and, um, and, and, and the skills of the future workforce remains one of the key areas for Kamka countries to improve. And we see a number of challenges across Kamka countries uh, you know, kind of related particularly to education. Education is one of the Kamka's weak points, to be honest, especially on the Global Labor Resilience Index. International performance indicators like PISA scores uh, reveal poor outcomes as, as seen from, from this figure. And low score by international standards on the education pillar can be explained by a range of factors, actually, including significant variation in quality of education delivery between rural and urban areas, and also the totality uh, of vocational education, which is one of the key components, actually, in closing the skills in the short run, actually. And uh, and clearly, uh, we th we should think about the few new new uh, future skills that will be demanded in the future and to what extent our universities, uh, our thing, uh, training institutes are coping uh, with, with that pace and providing the educational services with, for new skills now. And to what extent our uh, education system is still promoting the old skills. So, but what is good news is that in the, across the Kamka countries, uh, in terms of the education policy, um, we have, we're scoring pos quite positively on digital skills, uh, which could be leveraged, especially with the, with the level of uh, youth uh, workforce in the, in the region. And I will not go in deeper to that, but I think I have a couple of more slides here and I will you know, open up the floor for discussion. Um, of course, we have uh, matters of critical thinking, which is uh, the world average. Uh, we have uh, STEM graduates, which are performing relatively well compared to the world average. But I think these, the, these are vestiges of the um, uh, Soviet education system, which is now transformed. And some of the uh, advantages of that uh, should be leveraged, but we need to focus on the, uh, on the vocational education because it gives a, an opportunity to really um, close the gap in the short run, which is important to policymakers because uh, you know, unfortunately in many countries, not only in Kamka, we are talking about the quick wins uh, and uh, rather than uh, indulging in, uh, in, in solving systemic reform uh, issues. I think I have the last slide. I think if you can turn to the last slide. Yes, a whole of country approach. I will not stop here. So I think this was just a food for thought and how we can match the, the mismatch how to how we how do we solve this mismatch between the skills that are required in the labor market uh, and the the level of uh, this quality level of education systems and we have here uh, fortunately enough the leaders of the industry and uh, without further ado i would like to um, invite to, to the floor dr shams Kasim laka to really um, provide your wisdom to provide your perspective on on, on this matter and brought his. Thank you. Please, doctor. If you can, you know, you can if you can switch on your microphone, please. Okay, I got the Excellent. microphone on. And, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, 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 Dr. Zakasov, for for this introduction. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'll address today's topic by focusing on education as a very important vector of national development but also regional development. And I'm going to focus a little more on the regional development aspects because Kamka is, is really a, a, a regional, uh, is concerned about regional development and we are to explore ideas and, and approaches to regional development especially through education and which, which is market oriented etc. Uh, I will do this first by relating the experience of the Aga Khan Development Network or the AKDN which was established by His Highness the Aga Khan who is the Imam or spiritual leader of the Ismaili Muslim community spread over some 30 uh, countries 
And the AKDN is uh, focusing on improving the quality of life of the people it serves. That's the main purpose, improving the quality of life of the people. And it doesn't matter who they are, whether they are part of the Ismaili community or the wider community. In fact, the biggest benefit, 90% of the beneficiaries of our work are those who are not within our community. Uh, the Aga Khan Development Network operates on uh, the basis of uh, not-for-profit and it is secular in nature and serves all without regard to race, ethnicity, religion or gender. We work uh, largely in South Asia, uh, mostly in sub Saharan Africa, uh, in Central Asia, East and parts of Europe and North America. Uh, in the Kamkar region, we operate in Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan uh, and uh, from time to time we have also worked in Uzbekistan. Uh, we contribute to development of the communities in a holistic manner. Our philosophy is that communities must be developed in a holistic manner and not just focusing on economics or on the culture or sometimes uh, only on health or education. You have to have a holistic approach if we are to make a difference uh, to the people in the communities at large. And we do this also out of conviction that regional development and development on the basis of regional approaches uh, in education, uh, for example in energy generation which we are involved with, in financial and communication services and in health, in culture, these are best done on a regional basis. Uh, a century of experience uh, uh, of working in these thematic uh, areas uh, has taught us that development has the best outcome if it is done holistically, as I mentioned, if it is done in partnership with the communities, civil societies and governments as well as other development partners and if it is done on a regional basis. Because very often the countries we are dealing with are much smaller in terms of uh, the bigger regional powers and they can make a big difference if they work together collectively in a, in, on a regional basis and have some commonalities amongst which education is going to be a very important common element as health as well. We must not forget health the, and the pandemic has just shown us how important regional approaches to health are. Our longest experience of development is in the school uh, uh, and university education uh, where we keep a keen eye on market needs and employment opportunities. It's not just to educate and, and then people take a degree and run around with a piece of paper to find a job, but we first study what the job market is and then establish the majors in our School of Arts and Sciences or in our School of Professional and Continuing Education uh, uh, where, where we have trained a large number of people uh, in short courses and in the research that we conduct in our graduate school of development. Uh, the Arakan Development Network operates 200 schools in these regions that I mentioned and it has got two universities, the Aga Khan University and the University of Central Asia. For over a hundred years, education, especially for women, has been our first vector in helping to improve the quality of life of the people. And I'm saying this as a Muslim as a, as, a, as a, because very often the impression is that the, uh, the, the Muslim societies don't value women's education. It's not so. Kamta has done a remarkable demonstration that it is the women who are making a huge contribution uh, compared to, for example, in some parts of South, uh, South Asia or Africa. So women's education is critical for us and that goes also for market, uh, for the market situation. They constitute 50% of the workforce in many parts of the region. Our educational work started first in the Indian subcontinent and then to Africa and over the last 25 years we've been in Central Asia as well. Now countries have been long acknowledging the importance of regional approaches on economic development but they haven't done so as much on education or health for example which are even in our experience more critical drivers of development because if you don't have good education and good health your economic development is not going to go through. Uh, I can speak a lot about this but uh, I, 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 we can come back to these issues later in the, in the, in the session. 
uh, we we obviously have uh, uh, gained the experience that uh, there is much to be gained in on a regional basis by sharing curricula, teaching methods, faculty development, uh, both at the university level and school level. And the bottom line is that there are far better prospects for cohesion among regional countries if the future decision makers and leaders were educated together. This would not only lead to lifelong friendships, but give them a better understanding of each other. There are too many tensions going on. If people have studied together, taught together, played together, there are possibilities that they will continue to work together. And that has been the case even after the Soviet Union. There was a lot of cohesion. Slowly, slowly there has been a divergence of nations. And I think we need to bring them together. And Kamkai is playing a very important role in this. So we established the University of Central Asia as a regional university, and which is focused on the education of mountain societies. I would also say that the founders included the Republic of Kazakhstan, the Kyrgyz Republic, the, the Republic of Tajikistan, and the Ismaili Imamat, uh, all of whom signed as founders of this university at an international treaty in 2000. And uh, we, we went to work. Uh, and today, uh, last week, we just graduated our first group of undergraduate degree holders. Uh, we have, in the meantime, our School of Professional and Continuing Education, which is focusing on short courses, market-oriented, immediate uh, application of employment. We have trained 150,000 people. Now, our work includes work in Afghanistan also. It is not just the three countries I mentioned, in, uh, but Afghanistan, which is also part of Kanka. So, we have uh, five, six centers in Afghanistan. In all, we have 15 centers in which we uh, impart education. Now, I wanted to also say that uh, the conclusion is that the regional countries might take another look at this uh, strategy of the education and be working much more collaboratively on education. Their markets are interchangeable. There is migration of one uh, group of citizens to another. They go to Russia, they go to Uzbekistan, they go to Kazakhstan from any of these countries. And if they are working, if they are educated on a regional curricula or understanding of what's going on elsewhere, their prospects for employment are huge. Uh, tailoring education systems to market needs rather than the old Soviet system in many parts of the Kamka is, is a very important need. I also th say that training in uh, IT, multiple languages including English, Russian and Chinese. By the way, English is the, uh, the language of instruction at the University of Central Asia. The center of gravity of economic development has significantly shifted from the west now to the east. And it is important for Kamkar region, regional countries to understand what it means to them. Uh, the aid may still be coming from the west and from you know, wherever, but the, the development prospects are going to be much stronger with their linkages in the east. Uh, China, Russia and Kazakhstan and, and many other countries, Uzbekistan. So I'm just uh, including these remarks uh, with, with uh, giving you some examples of what we have actually in practical terms done and what could be done in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kasim Laka. These were visionary comments for the whole region. Um, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Fariz Ismail Zadeh, what do you think are the uh, takeaways uh, in terms of the, the innovation that you've been uh, driving in, in Azerbaijan? Because we've, we've, we've heard from uh, Dr. Kasim Laka in terms of inspiring uh, women for education supporting uh, the, the, their participation in the labor force with the, the regional co collaboration based on the good practices on, on education uh, in the region, which is which is still lacking. Yeah. So what what do you think are the solutions from your perspective uh, and also in, in terms of really um, co coping with the rapidly changing market demands and what is it that you can you, you see as a, as, a, as a solution for the whole region, not only for Azerbaijan, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am very grateful for this opportunity to be part of this panel, and I appreciate all other speakers as well. The education topic is a very important topic for our region because uh, the region is changing so fast, 
And uh, one of the challenges is how to prepare a young generation of professionals for our uh, economy, for our uh, society, for our independent countries. So I have been working for 15 years at ADA University. This is a flagship university of Azerbaijan, which hosted the Kamka Forum. And um, one of the most important challenges, I would say, is that uh, the Soviet era universities are feeling very detached from market economy. We have many universities who don't understand the demands of the market. They produce some specialties and pro professions that are not needed in the market. Uh, on, the, on the contrary, there are some specialties that are very much needed in the market, but somehow universities do not produce them. For example, I would say HR managers, data analytics, business analytics, designers, um, computer engineers, computer scientists, um, social media specialists. These are really hot professions that are much needed in the market, but graphic designers, but somehow our universities keep producing lawyers, international relations specialists. I don't know, this, there's a big, big mismatch. And uh, also universities are somehow operating in their own universe. Uh, which uh, very rarely interacts with the real market, real business. So in order to solve that uh, mismatch, in order to solve that problem, uh, we have been trying for the, from the very first day of our university, we have been trying to work very closely with the corporate sector, with employers, with the real market, in order to create this bridge of communication between the educators and the consumers of this educational product. So we have created advisory board composed of several uh, representatives of corporations. And this advisory board helps us on many, many issues, including advising on curriculum, advising on skills that are needed, uh, advising on some new degree programs. For example, we have recently opened data analytics program, which is very much needed in the market. We have opened marketing program, digital marketing program. Uh, these are the specialties that are needed in the market. Um, advisory board also helps us with fundraising because relying on government funds is not enough. So we are doing active fundraising and we are getting some sponsored money to, uh, you know, fund some scholarships, fund some research projects, um, as well as special projects such as summer schools for students. And finally, uh, relationships with corporate sector helps us to bring together research and innovation. Um, very often we see that uh, research at universities is very much detached from real life. Uh, we want research to be applied. We want research to be real life based. So therefore, we often bring companies and our professors, students, researchers, young talents, and they discuss some research projects, innovative projects, some startup projects, and they work together on this. So there, this, this research is applied and this research is demand driven. Demand meaning driven by the companies and driven by the consumers. Um, finally, I want to say that it's not only enough to work with corporate sector, but also it's very important to work with international partners. So internationalization, uh, learning from the European universities experience, L uh, developing mobility programs, partnership programs, dual degree programs has been really uh, strengthening our university. And we have at the moment five double degree programs and 56 exchange programs with foreign universities. Um, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that only by having open door policy, by reaching out to multiple stakeholders, by creating multilateral platforms, universities can develop, uh, increase their quality of education and really become epicenters of knowledge, innovation and research in the societies. Thank you, I will stop here and I will be happy to join the Q&A session later. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ismail Zadeh. Indeed, um, I think you echoed what uh, Dr. Kasim Waka was, was, was mentioning in terms of the mismatch and, and, and really uh, contributing with, uh, with the new skills to the labor market. Now, when you mentioned, uh, I know that uh, ADA University is, uh, uh, is a leading university, not only in, in Azerbaijan, but a wider region. And I think what uh, Dr. Kasim saying about uh, having a together. I think it's, it's something that ADA University was contributing to. I know that some of the 
uh, leaders of, of the Kamka region were also spending some time in, in executive education programs of ADA University. So it's, it's highly commendable. And we would want to see more of that, I think, between uh, the, the Kamka countries. Now, uh, let's switch to the next speaker. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Hikmat Abdurrahmanov, who, who is uh, who's doing an, an interesting uh, work. He's, 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 a, he's a great multitasker, uh, and uh, he has an, an extraordinary story. Uh, not only about the country, was Uzbekistan, but about his efforts in really uh, driving different business projects. And he is the real uh, um, living link between academia and industry that um, Dr. Ismail Zeta was talking about. And Hikmat, if you can talk more about how do you make sure that at Teams University and other business projects, you, you, you ensure this link and, 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 you know, and close this gap. Thank you very much, Yirnar. Um... Good good evening, um, dear colleagues, friends, on this panel discussion, and I'll be happy to share a little bit of, um, let's say, Uzbekistan's angle, what, what's happening here in terms of higher education, and how us as business people, we have approached and became part of higher education, and how that uh, potentially might go into a regional, let's say, collaboration. And we have some examples of that. So uh, let me give you a little bit of the background information. <clears throat> Uzbekistan was pretty much closed in terms of higher education. Um, uh, till 2016, you, you wouldn't see any private higher education institutions in the country. It, is very, it was very much centralized, um, state-dominated, there were only few international branches operating in Tashkent, but uh, but other than that, um, we had very low coverage um, in 2016, which was the anti-record. We only had 8% of um, being able to enter the universities. And as a result, um, there was a huge problem of uh, labor migration to ne near nearby countries, Kazakhstan, Russia, and um, other countries in the world because students, um, school graduates were not able to get um, good quality education in the country. So the, the higher education sector was not open for competition, very centralized, very corrupt. Um, as I said, poor quality and low coverage um, of, of the graduates were able to get higher education. So what changed was with the new government, there was a new um, higher education uh, strategy set um, by 2030, it was decided that uh, there will be at least 30 private higher education institutions launched, plus uh, different bilateral and international uh, projects uh, had to be uh, foreign Russian, UK, British and other countries uh, were invited to open um, their, their universities in the country. Uh, currently, the situation uh, improved a little bit. Um, so we, we have around 20, 15, uh, 15 to 20% of school graduates who are being able to, to get higher education these days. And we saw this as an opportunity uh, as people who, as employers, as uh, people who um, on a regular basis participated in various business schools and uh, various uh, attended various universities and executive programs, we have seen this as an opportunity. And it took us two years of the negotiations with the government, learning various models around the world. Uh, thanks to the power of our network, we have um, visited almost all regional countries, including Central Asia, including Caucasus, including uh, Russia, Ukraine, and, uh, and, uh, and other developed uh, and, and developed. We to understand what are we lacking behind? What private universities are currently uh, look like? What have they have gone through? What kind of mistakes they've, they've made during the 90s and 2000s? And gladly, last year in the middle of pandemics, in the middle of quarantine, we, were, we got government's decree. Uh, we were uh, allowed, we were permitted to, to start our university. And um, throughout that research and analysis, we decided to go with uh, British education standards, British education uh, model and uh, language of instruction at our university is English. And we've been able to re recruit a very small cohort of students last year, uh, a bit less than 100 students started their 
BA education. And um, gladly, within a within year and a half, we've gone through a very uh, rigorous uh, and comprehensive procedure of validation. We got validated by uh, LSB, a university, which um, uh, validated our three courses. Uh, all of them are focused on entrepreneurship because we are uh, business background people. Uh, it is um, eight founders who joined all together their efforts. And uh, this university, Team University, is completely funded by private co companies, mostly champions in their fields. Uh, our company is in trade. Uh, one of our founders is one of the leading uh, uh, owner of uh, retail chain, the biggest retail chain. We have two representatives of financial sector who also decided to join this project. So all three courses, one is in international business, as Fariz was just referring to. We have seen a huge demand in specialists, and that's the topic of our main topic of our conversation, that we decided to match the existing a lack uh, gap between the market and, and the universities. Our observations are really lagging behind. They're not providing competitive and up-to-date uh, professions. And, and we decided that international business market, marketing and digital innovation, that is what we have started with. Obviously, all of the three courses are very much interlinked with entrepreneurship as, as, as a philosophy and concept. Um, what we also decided to do, and that's, I think, um, something that we really understand that we are actually setting the standard for, because we're one of the youngest and first private universities in the country. We decided to go with the proper good governance and we have set the board of trustees uh, that, is, um, uh, that is led by uh, strong professionals who have regional and international experience. Recently, Andrew Wachtel, who was the rector of AUCA in Bishkek, joined us our, our board of trustees to be the chairman. We have um, a first rector of uh, Skolkova Business School, also Andre Volkov to join our board, and we have a number of other independent directors who are ensuring that we as uh, founders uh, actually uh, delegating the, all the powers to professionals and they in, in their own um, uh, level then appoint right people in, in, uh, at the university. So we thought that starting it right from the beginning is very important and uh, this year we are actually expanding our campus, we are expanding the programs. As Fariz mentioned, we also focus very much on industry links we have uh, launched our entrepreneurship hub, uh, acceleration and incubation programs, which is also, I think, really helping us a lot to position ourselves as a very practical orientated um, institution. So uh, coming to the conclusion of my, um, uh, let's say, comments and, and uh, let's say, um, uh, exchanging, experience, uh, exchanging experience from my side, is to become mid-sized university of around 1,500 to 2,000 students, um, being uh, one of the leaders uh, in, in business, among business universities. Um, but in, interestingly, we don't want to limit ourselves by only business fields. As it was said, we really also would like to explore opportunities within the disciplines, various disciplines on one side, um, uh, let's say technical, scientific, um, uh, arts and design, but on the other edge, we want to interlink that with entrepreneurship and we see that this interdisciplinary approach would really make a difference um, and will produce very competitive um, graduates who will right after that and actually within the, the process of their education will enter the job market, not only of Uzbekistan, we also would like uh, to establish regional cooperation with regional players as well. So this is just uh, some high as Yernar, you mentioned, being very practical orientated, uh, being really within that process. Uh, we understand that we are really baby university and the whole industry is really young because it just opened up and gladly we can exchange that experience with the countries that have started this journey uh, several decades earlier than us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hikmat. Uh, Uzbekistan was the named the country of the year, I think it was last year. Now, in terms of the pace of reforms, and then and including the reforms of education system in Uzbekistan, I mean, I can argue that you, you are to a certain extent a product of this opening up and reforms in Uzbekistan. 
Now, in your uh, uh, in your opinion, should the education reforms begin at the top or or, or, or at the bottom of education systems? How to make sure that these education systems evolve fast enough to really uh, match that market demand? If you can add a few comments. Yeah, yeah, you're not. You know, there are very um, hot discussions on whether you know on whether higher education sector should completely uh, become liberalized in the country uh, on one hand and um, all the procedures of getting the licenses and permits has to be just um, you know uh, taken away and and just open it up to be a very liberal uh, sector on the other hand obviously all those big dinosaurs and big players um, there's a sense that they will not be able to adjust instantly so uh, there has been a number of state universities that were chosen to be, let's say, an example and, and a sandbox to, to really experiment what has to be done. That uh, reminds me of Russian uh, model of um, transformation or reforms. They have this program which is called 5100 when they let's say, and they're trying through those champions, they are trying to uh, really bring reforms to, to all higher education industry. Uh, if you ask my uh, opinion, I am more uh, fond of more liberal uh, competitive model. I think that uh, if we really continue protecting and creating uh, that those, let's say, very protective uh, environment for the universities, they will not being they will not be able to transform. Um, and and it, it's, it's a huge sector with employing hundreds of thousands or probably even millions of people. Yes, this is going to be a, a tough time, but I think it's better to go through that very instantly. That uh, probably reminds us of a more, uh, let's say, Georgian model when <laughs> liberalization happened at once, obviously with its own, all, with its own pros and cons, but at the end of the day, I I visited almost all big uh, um, projects, uh, Georgian, uh, let's say, universities, private universities, and I have uh, gone through even actually exporting uh, services, educational uh, services to near nearby countries. That to me really shows uh, a good model of how transformation should happen. Excellent. So we should deregulate from the top, from the top but the real education reform should come from the bottom in terms of the competitive universities uh, in, a, in an open competition. All right, thank you. Now we have Talan Sultanov who is um, uh, heading the um, uh, Kyrgyz uh, chapter for Internet Society. Uh, it's an internet, in, 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 interesting organization. If you can tell more uh, Talan more about how you are contributing to the education system and is it to do with the vocational training uh, short-term education, uh, building the, uh, the, the the vocational skills, or we're talking about the you know long-term education programs. Please. Thanks so much, Yernar. I had prepared a few slides. Uh, if possible, can we bring them up to screen? Please. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned, Yernar, uh, I am representing here the Kyrgyz uh, chapter of the Internet Society. It's a pleasure to be part of this very distinguished panel and I'm very glad that we are able to share our uh, experience and maybe some of our knowledge with uh, participants of uh, today's uh, forum uh, and I'd like to thank organizers for inviting us. Uh, next slide please. So uh, answering to your question Yernar, actually uh, all of the above and uh, what what really is uh, what we're trying to do is uh, we saw the pro from the previous presentations as well as from the uh, presentation of the keynote spe speaker today Douglas Becker there is kind of tidal shift happening in the educational sector and uh, the new technologies internet connectivity is uh, helping us uh, and opening up lots of opportunities uh, from the other hand uh, these are opportunities are only available for those who are connected. And if we look at the map of uh, uh, Central Asia, in, in this slide, I'm speaking more about the CA part of the CAMCA abbreviation. We can see that uh, you know, uh, half of the population of Central Asia are not uh, using the internet and uh, several countries of the region are actually below the global standards in, in terms of internet connectivity. And if you, we look at the broadband uh, connectivity, the figures are significantly less. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, so what, what that means in practical terms, it means that if you, for example, would like to download a movie or an educational film, it will take you hours and hours uh, in our region to actually download and watch this film, if you have the internet connectivity. However, there is a huge problem that, you know, so many people of, uh, in our countries do not have uh, such a luxury. Yeah. Next slide, please. So, uh, uh, there are several challenges uh, related to this, why we have such bad statistics in terms of internet access. And uh, we can see that the big issue is infrastructure is not available everywhere. Especially, it's a, such a big challenge for Central Asia because we are landlocked uh, continent. Some of the countries in the region are landlocked and mountainous. Uh, some of the countries are double landlocked, like uh, Uzbekistan, uh, from where is our previous speaker. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this uh, situation, and especially COVID, has shown that you know, the digital divide is there in our region and it's actually widening. Uh, and the World Bank has conducted the statistics uh, that uh, only 0.6%, that is less than 1% of poor households have computers or devices. What does it mean that if you are a kid uh, in a village, then uh, the issue is one, does your village have the internet connectivity or your home? But even if there is connectivity, there are very few devices available for uh, people in, you know, uh, in rural and remote areas. And uh, even if we talk about television, that you know, during COVID times, uh, students had to learn lessons from TV. But what if you have several children in the household and only, only one television set? A big challenge. Another issue has to do with skills. So maybe you have the internet, maybe you have the devices, but are you able to use these devices and the uh, internet uh, proactively? And it's not only about children, maybe actually children are better adapters, but it's, uh, it's about teachers who have to deal with the challenges. It's about parents who have to help, you know, children uh, do studies online. And uh, another major uh, issue and another major challenge for our countries is the relevant educational content. So if we have the internet connectivity and everything and devices, but the content is either in different languages in the languages that we don't understand, or you know, it's uh, not very much relevant to our educational uh, purposes. So having uh, relevant content is another major issue. Next slide, please. So what we as internet society have been trying to do, uh, as you're now, you were posing a question, what's the best approach top down or bottom up? I think it has to be both. And you know, during the COVID situation, of course, the governments and the ministries, for example, in Kyrgyzstan, Ministry of Education, tried to connect every school to the internet. However, in the country, there were 20 uh, villages that were extremely difficult to connect to the, to the internet. They were unconnected. And you can see in this village, one of them is located uh, in our Batken province. And to get there, you have to uh, walk through the narrow mountain passes, passes uh, and uh, bring in the equipment. And this village has no electricity and no radio, no TV, and of course, no internet. And these are some of the areas where we are trying to work from our bottom-up approach. And the goal is to demonstrate that if we can connect to the internet, the most difficult location, then the, all the you know, locations in the middle should be able, we should be able to connect. Next slide, please. Uh, if they have no internet, we have solutions such as offline digital libraries. So it's in our case, we called it the Ilim box and we brought to all the schools in the country which had no internet connectivity, these devices, which you can see on the picture on the left, very small device and you don't need to have internet connectivity and you don't even have to have electricity. You can see a small solar panel, which would help power this device. And you can access all the educational content that's available through your smartphone. Next slide, please. 
And uh, here I would like to present maybe some of the suggestions how we could improve the situation so that every child, every teacher, anywhere in, you know, uh, in, our, in, in our countries could benefit from this you know, technological revolution, this 4.0. Uh, one of the recommendations is what we call is uh, dig one policy. Uh, you can see this uh, picture is actually very close to my home. Uh, this road, this was a very beautiful paved asphalt road just built you know, two years ago. But then, of course, they didn't put up the communications infrastructure and they decided to do it after the road was you know, renovated. And you can see it's all dug up and there is no more uh, asphalt. But if we have this dig ones policy, we could do it at once and people could enjoy infrastructure better. Next slide. Another major issue is that you don't have to have a broadband or uh, internet through internet cables. You can use uh, radio spectrum uh, to reach locations which are very far or which are very remote mountainous areas. However, the issue of you know, spectrum, it's like what it's called spectrum hoarding. Big companies get all the spectrum or the government keeps the spectrum to itself and uh, small companies or small uh, no, uh, entrepreneurs are not able to use it to be able to can connect all the remote areas. So spectrum management is another area where we, we need to look. Next slide. We would need to promote more competition. Uh, you now, as uh, Hikmat was saying that there are, there were very few universities. Now there are, thanks to right regulations, competition is coming up. Same has to be with, you know, uh, telecom companies, internet providers, the consolidation is, is in, this, in, in the sector is very real, not only on the global scale where you have, you know, Googles and the Facebooks gobbling up very small startups, but also on the level of our countries. You know, for example, in Kyrgyzstan, we can see how all the small uh, you know, companies are actually disappearing. And instead of the market, instead of diversifying, it's actually becoming a oligopoly or monopoly. Next slide, please. Uh, we need to support, you know, coming back to the question, the bottom-up initiatives. Actually, this is a 17-year-old uh, uh, kid, uh, high school kid in a very remote village. We taught him how to connect internet cables to the households. And now he is the guy to go to. Every house wants, uh, his, his name is Kender, to come and help them connect to the internet, uh, which we brought uh, to this village using uh, wireless technologies. Next slide. Uh, sharing infrastructure is another big issue. You can see here it's three uh, cell phone towers in the, very, in the same locations. We have three mobile operators in the country. So instead of cooperating and putting all their antennas on one tower, they, they each has to build their own because of, there is no you know, encouragement of sharing infrastructure and cooperating. Next slide, please. And I think uh, one of the last concluding slides here is the very major issue of privacy and personal data protection. The more we go online, the more children and students become digitally connected, the bigger this issue will become. And this picture is just an ordinary intersection in Bishkek. And you can see just on one of the uh, poles, there are three cameras, most likely with free face recognition technologies. And, it, and total uh, cameras on this very ordinary intersection is, I think, almost a dozen. And we as citizens don't know what's happening with all this data that these cameras are collecting. Who is using them? How they are using it? Nobody knows. Next slide, please. So this was actually the last slide and the conclusion of, the, my, of my presentation. So I'd, I'd, I'd just like to conclude saying that, you know, uh, there are so many opportunities opening up thanks to new technologies. However, there is this, you know, uh, part of the society which is unconnected. And, you know, in our region, it's, the situation is actually worse than, you know, globally. Uh, but there are ways where we can, you know, even individual initiatives or small level initiatives can make a major difference in bringing uh, people to the uh, internet 
so that they would be able to access educational resources so that they can improve their digital skills and so that they could compete in the global economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Talant. Uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you for sharing the good practices. I think something that we should now steer the conversation towards. Now we know the challenges, of course, the ICT infrastructure and overall infrastructure, getting the basics right is still uh, on the agenda of the countries. Let's, let's be open about it. Now, but if we can steer the conversation towards the good practices that Talant was sharing, some of the, you know, some of them bigger, some of them small, but importantly, to really share the good practices among the company countries would, would be beneficial to all the countries, I guess, to all the policymakers. So I know, you know how much, you know, uh, amazing entrepreneurial spirit uh, is there in, in Kyrgyzstan. It's, it's extraordinary that, I mean, I've experienced myself. So it's, it's important to, that we have, you know, you know, we share this spirit across uh, the company countries. We have um, Irakli Laitadze. Dr. Laitadze is, 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 is an interesting professional coming from a, from international relations background, but also being from a wider education, strong education background, now contributing uh, to, to Georgia as a, in, a, in a leading private sector uh, investor uh, company. Uh, would you please share your views, how, you know, private, how actually investors see the education system and how you, what solutions you see in the, in this field? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And so good morning to those who are now in Washington DC and Toronto and good afternoon, good evening to those who are in Kamka now. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank Ramsell Foundation for organizing our reunion. And it's my privilege to participate in this panel and thank you my dear panel, panel colleagues. I will start with my personal experience and then move, move towards the macro situation. Although, although I'm a lecturer in the university, this is not my main occupation. I'm on the, let's say, receiving side of the higher and, and vocational education. I represent uh, the demand part of the invisible hand of the market. What allows me to say so, the, because I hold the position of the chief financial officer at GMT Group, one of the leading and most venerable Georgian companies in the sphere of hospitality and the real estate development. We own and operate landmark and historic spot throughout the capital city. And until recently, we owned the company named Sante, which is the bigger local player in the production and distribution of dairy products. And later we sold it to the French multinational Lactalis. So as a member of a top management team, I participated, uh, either participated or witnessed um, very many, maybe hundreds of job interviews in such diverse fields like a service, cooking, engineering, production, IT, HR, security, internal audit, accountancy, financial management, marketing, middle level management, general management. And despite the fact that we offer competitive salaries, it's not easy to find decent professionals. And once we select someone, um, we, uh, until signing long-term employment contract, we have them on three time, three months paid probation period. During this period, sometimes we encounter another set of problems, uh, so-called soft skills problems, like in this case, lower than expected responsibility to, and even the negligence toward the job, jobs assigned. And finally, we do manage to uh, gather the cream, but it's not that there is an abundance of it in the market, although situation has been improving in last year. I'll start from uh, basic and high school education, and as, as there is no higher education without basic school education, and I will move to higher and vocational education. Well, the state expenditure on education has increased from 2.8% of GDP to 3.6% of, of GDP in the uh, last six years and will reach 6% reach of GDP in 2022, which is a very positive dynamics. Although reforms, uh, also the reforms foresee the new school model, professional development of teacher, increased access quality and variety of vocational education. Just a few words, what is the new school model mean? This is innovative model and it means moving uh, from centralized to decentralized approach, more gearing toward the needs of school pupils, more autonomy to schools in choosing the teaching materials and the means to implement uh, the knowledge. 
The teachers will not be giving like concrete lesson recommendation, but will be supplied with long-term objectives, which will serve to develop the analytical abilities of the kids. And the digital technology will be the uh, will be part of the process. As of now, this project has been implemented in 178 schools on the level of one to six grades. And by year 2024, the project should be implemented in uh, all public schools of Georgia. Also, the government has created rather favorable conditions for private education so are the, quite a lot of uh, private schools and higher uh, educational institutions but there are problems that persist though they are not arts unsurmountable well in secondary and high schools there are there is let's say uh, another around one teacher per nine pupil in georgia which is higher than average oecd indicator which is one teacher per 14 people but there is a def deficit in both in functional areas like science and mathematics as well in geographic areas rural and mountainous settlements Due to the excessive number of teachers, this profession remains low paid job and is by around 30% lower than the average salary throughout the country, despite the fact that the salaries of the teacher has been increasing by 45% in the year 2014-2019. Uh, uh, the professional uh, vocational education is not prestigious in Georgia. By the end of uh, 2019, so I'm speaking pre about pre-COVID times mostly, only 6% of students of relevant age group, age group were engaged in vocational education, while more than 60% were studying in higher educational institutions. The number of students enrolled in vocational education has been decreasing from 21,000 in 2013 until uh, 12,000 in 2019. And situation is more difficult because the majority of professional colleges, the few they are, they are mostly located in capital city. This deficit is partly compensated by the private company that offer on the job training. Uh, then, however, paradoxical it may sound, higher education doesn't increase the employment chances adequately. Uh, the, uh, the reasons for low return on this education investment is twofold. First, the system of higher education supplies greater number of graduates and postgraduates than needed. The current economic structure of Georgia requires more personnel of low qualification and qualified handymen like mechanics, carpenters, plumbers, electricians. And the second reason is that the future higher education students take un uninformed decisions about the prospective job markets. As a result, there is a either unemployment or inadequacy between the occupied position and received education. While the average growth of Georgian economy was 5.1% in the year 2011-2019, the contribution of workforce war was only 0.8% and the rest of the increase was due to the capital accumulation and increase of the productivity. The economy of Georgia does not create sufficient jobs for university graduates. While more than 60% of students are college graduates, only 35% of entry positions actually require higher, higher education. This is more the structural problem of uh, like a structural situation of the economy. So then college graduates are forced to seek the employment in low qualification jobs, which leads to the uh, gross misallocation of the human resources. As an example, like more than 50% of vacant entries uh, were in tourist service positions and as a sales consultant. This is caused by the dominance of tourism and trade in Georgian economy. Another problem is agriculture, which remains very ineffective sector, which saps 36% of workforce with the output of only 7% of GDP. In general, the chance of unemployment of youngsters in the age of 20, 25 years is by 70% higher than those of their parents. The higher than average remuneration uh, in financial and law sectors pushes prospective students to engage in the studies of management, finance, accountancy, law. In 2019, 55% of graduates were coming from these fields of studies, while the economy simply doesn't require that number of lawyers and accountants. And uh, like the international comparison proves also this unreasonable allocation. As I have mentioned, 55% of Georgian graduates come from the fields of management, finance, accountancy, while such global finance centers as UK and USA are, a respective ratio of such kind of students are 19 and 17% of uh, respectively. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in Georgia, the ratio of students engaged in studies of engineering, construction, production, which and these sectors account 24 24% of GDP, uh, this ratio of students is only 8%. So as per employees surveys, the deficit of technical skills is a big challenge. Well, I think the education policy of Georgia should be more geared towards economic structure of the country, as well as I aiming to push it out of low-valued economic activity. The priorities probably 
uh, are the sectors of civil engineering, logistics, transport, energy, infrastructure, business process outsourcing, like customer service management, IT computer engineering, big data analysis. Uh, we are a typical country in the lower middle income trap. And we, if we want to get out of this trap, and we do want, more knowledge intensive jobs should be created. Uh, and uh, at the end, I would like to say the following. Well, I guess that I'm an old school man, thus I still don't see universities as a factory stamping out money making men and women. While IT, computer engineering, law and accountancy are noble pursuits and in general, any kind of honest work is God blessed. Still the pure mathematics, pure physics, pure chemistry, classics, philosophy and disciplines like this make the countries great. And with all due respect to not financial managers, lawyers, lawyers and farmers are able to do so. I partly answered the Alisher's question or remark, I guess. So basically that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Leitad, a lot of statistics, um, interesting data. Um, indeed, it's something that, you know, that there's a big, there's a story behind uh, what you're saying, the story about Georgia and, and about the, the reform that we've been following, whether it be the police reform or the education system and other. And I think it's something that we should be studying. And what, uh, what I think uh, uh, Fariz, uh, Fariz Ismail Zeta was mentioning, the research, uh, the regional research that, uh, that is lacking uh, is something that we should do together. The, uh, as, as ADA universities are focusing on, on researching the, the, the countries of the region, I think it's important to really research each other in terms of the good practices, in terms of actually making the case studies, case study of, of each country's, each university's success stories, so that we can you know leverage because it's much more important to learn from each other than from far advanced economies whose experience might be of less limited relevance to, to our economies. Now, um, uh, Dr. Laidadza, I mean, uh, in, in terms of the reforms that I think that you, you mentioned that are important, of course, the traditional universities are important, but when, when it comes to actually making money, and you are from the private sector, we see that, you know, the, the peop some people with no university degrees are earning more money than those with the higher education degrees. So it's a kind of a, it's a paradox of these days, right? So what, what is it uh, that, that we should do as policymakers to make sure that our education systems are up to date? Maybe we should focus not on switch the focus from the higher education to vocational education to make sure that at least our youngsters, you know, can, can be financially stable with short-term courses, making more money and actually, you know, really improving their lives in the end, uh, instead of having oversupply of highly educated labor force. Yes, uh, the, uh, like the, in this case, like uh, like in the case of Georgia, the market, uh, okay, when I started like my financial career, like it was many years ago, so it was really lack and deficit of it. But now the market is saturated uh, and oversaturated with, the, with uh, accountants, with financial managers, with general managers, with uh, lawyers, and uh, and just just economy cannot produce uh, the, the 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 vacancies like the jobs for them. So and the uh, and the structure of Georgian economy is that it's on the end. Unfortunately, it's on the end of uh, our comparative advantage. Advantage is the cheap labor force and uh, like a, like a asset like a geographical position which is just God given. And uh, so. <clears throat> But as the financial sectors and law sectors offer much higher uh, compensation, the people still strive, but they heard out because there, there are no places available. So they, they are kind of settled uh, settled with a lower qualification jobs, which causes the frustration, personal frustration and social tensions, etc. So uh, vocational uh, training, a vocational job. Okay, everybody wants their children to be financial directors. No, nobody wants them to be carpenters, or less less people want them to be carpenters. Uh, but uh, Switzerland is a very good example when the, quite a considerable uh, part of the population are, are don't don't have high education and they're very well well very well off. So maybe this is this is the so either to adjust to, to to adjust to the market demands otherwise the market forces will just leave you uh, i mean the, the person on the margins of the society and another outcome is that uh, 
with uh, like uh, quite accurate government involvement and also by considering the overall market forces and market dynamics of the world that the country starts to, to move from labor intensive uh, jobs to labor intensive uh, comparative advantage to more knowledge base or resource base com comparative with human resource but it's a long longer term solution i would say thank you dr Maipadze. gentlemen uh, it's been an interesting uh, interaction uh, extremely insightful uh, comments from everyone and we have an interesting question also to to, to all the panelists um, it goes like this, 30 years ago, the higher education system in the Kamka area was able to provide world-class education, for example, mathematics, physics, and chemistry schools in Uzbekistan, etc. Will, uh, will, uh, will the region be able to reach that level again? If yes, then when? So, gentlemen, who can uh, take up the question? Please. Doctor, uh, maybe Doctor Lazar, we can give the floor to Doctor uh, Kasim Laka, and then we can give give back to you. Please, Doctor Kasim Laka, if you can switch on your microphone, please. So, so um, uh, as, as someone who has been involved uh, for the last ten years on the reform of higher education in Pakistan, uh, I was leading this effort. I can tell you that there is no magic wand. That which has taken a couple of generations to deteriorate cannot be put right in a matter of five years. Because the, the problem is that the, it, it is like the problem of the graveyard. It's difficult to move the graveyard because you do not have the cooperation of the occupants. I don't know if you understood the point. The, the point is that faculty members do not want change. The deans and, and all the senior people are not interested in change and reforms. They are the ones who will uh, assiduously oppose any changes because they know better or oh, in the Soviet time or in the, in the previous, before our country became independent from British or whatever it was, we used to be this. Well, we have to take a modern look. So the reforms have to be worked, as somebody has already mentioned here, from the top but also by the bottom and it is extremely important first of all that the government has a political will if you if the government doesn't have a political will to face reforms to face some demonstrations by faculty members or by students because reforms means you give up the rights of some and you increase the rights of others as well so political will is the starting point secondly you got to take the university leadership and the faculty along and the students will come along if the faculty are with you and that means more dialogue giving them a role in the reforms not simply saying these are the reforms you implement them so i think the, the last part of the question if so when i think it will take maybe 10 years maybe 15 years if you are fortunate because it, it, it's like a, it, it's like a, a, a oil tanker. It cannot be shifted. It, it cannot shift its direction in a matter of seconds or a minute, matter of minutes. It takes a long time to take a different turn. So, a lot of patience, working with the political will, working with those who are the faculty members and leaders of the university, working with employers. They should be the drivers as well, asking for reforms. And the taxpayers are the ones who are giving money to the universities. They should have a say in it. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, uh, maybe, uh, Doctor Leitadze, a quick comment, then we switch to Talant uh, Sultana, please. Sure, uh, the answering, trying to answer to Alisher's um, question, uh, the the fact that uh, that truly the schools of mathematics and physics and chemistry were rather developed throughout the Soviet Union, but this was the I guess my guess is that this was the unique uh, unique country within in unique uh, historic circumstances. The whole economy and the whole infrastructure. Uh, was geared towards the in incoming or impeding war. So the fundamental sciences were very, very important for the preparation of the war, for the pre preparation development of the weapon, the different size of weapon, being it's nuclear or being it's chemical or biological or uh, just the firearms. And even at the schools, if you, 
I remember at the military lessons we were given at the age of 15, I knew how to disassemble and reassemble the Kalashnikov assault rifle. I was taught this in the school. And so the, uh, the, the, the fact that the, this, uh, this, this uh, subjects were developed, uh, that, that's, that's where coming out of the interest of the state. Uh, while like social sciences, like psychology or economics or sociology were basically neglected or on a very embryonic level of development in Soviet Union. Of course, the mathematics, pure mathematics, pure chemistry, pure physics, it's a luxury and it's affordable only on the uh, affordable, either by very wealthy private institutions like the United States, big universities or just directly government sponsored. And I, I don't know whether we will be able to continue these schools, unfortunately. I'm not sure. But... Thank you, Dr. Litanza. Please, uh, Mr. Talas Sultanov. Yes, uh, uh, that's a very good question. I'd like to uh, look from a little bit different angle at this issue. Uh, I think it is possible that our countries produce very high quality specialists. However, uh, finding uh, jobs uh, for these uh, specialists in our countries, well, at least in Kyrgyzstan, it's a big issue and huge challenge that we are facing at the moment. And I think many developing countries are dealing with the same, especially in countries where you know, we are following this social model, right? Where we subsidize education. All these people who have been trained you know, to become doctors or to become uh, ICT experts are leaving the country. So for example, you know, Faris mentioned that state helps train these people in the universities, but they don't find opportunities at home and they live for better opportunities abroad. And there is one very kind of close case to us here. It's uh, one of our own fellows, uh, Aziz Abakirov, who was the champion of IT sector in Kyrgyzstan. And he coined the uh, term live in Kyrgyzstan and work with the whole world, was headhunted into Almaty. <laughs> And now he uh, and he took his slogan with him, and now uh, the slogan is "Live in Almaty and work with the world." <laughs> but it's just an, kind of an example of you know of a very serious problem. You know, of, uh, uh, our countries are losing, are going to lose specialists, and how we are going to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, um, gentlemen. Uh, if we have, we, if we don't have other um, comments, I'm mindful of time. Uh, let me yeah, conclude and wrap up the discussion. It's, and I think it's a daunting task for me because we've, uh, we've had uh, numerous insightful comments. But overall, uh, I think the questions were about how to make, make sure that our ex education systems um, are fast enough in terms of ev evolving to the, uh, to the market demands to make sure that we, have, we match the, the demand of the labor market and uh, to make sure that we actually contribute in the end. To the uh, to the well-being to the welfare of citizens, uh, but overall, I think we, we we've, we've discussed uh, the, uh, the the matters and, and I think good practices across the region that uh, every country in the Kamka region uh, are demonstrating, and that should be researched more and shared across the board. And importantly, we should facilitate these avenues when uh, regional leaders, future uh, the younger generation leaders of the Kamka. A region can actually spend time together, study together, really experiment and drive uh, common uh, projects together so that we, we have less uh, disagreements and more in a, in a commonalities to, to work on together. But we also talking, talked about the, how the education for, 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 the, for the women. And I think that women's participation in the labor force is extremely uh, an important topic in, in Central Asia and the Caucasus and, and the whole wider Kamka region. And I think it should be further um, promoted. Of course, uh, we talked about the the, the Soviet universities, that, uh, that the Soviet-based universities, I guess, that are uh, appearing to be a bit detached from the from the market. That they should be reformed, uh, and I think it's it's to do with the uh, policy maker, uh, policy makers in, in particular, and of course the, the, the issue of the academia and industry link is still still there. And uh, there are different solutions uh, to that coming from different universities that were mentioned here. Uh, clearly, regional research on, on should be further promoted to make sure that we understand each other. We understand the, the countries and the good practices that 
that, that that are plenty of that that, that should be uh, studied together. But more importantly, uh, what what was mentioned, I guess, is is, is the competition, is the uh, openness of the uh, of the policymakers and, and the system for open competition to make to make sure that there is a deregulation, liberalization of the uh, education system from the from the top. And there is space for competition so that only the strongest institutions survive. Uh, that's an, an important message. We talked about getting the basics right. We talked about the ICT uh, infrastructure lacking in the other uh, areas that we should get the, get things done before we, we talk about the innovation, before we talk about empower, empowering every citizen. Clearly, the uh, urban and rural uh, gap still uh, is very wide across uh, the country countries, and it's something to do with with the financing and, 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 and bridging this gap. Comes to, to the question of you know regional col collaboration as well. We've heard uh, interesting good practices um, from uh, from Kyrgyzstan and other countries in terms of the offline dig digital libraries, you know the spectrum management, other and other big and small initiatives that could be you know studied further to really uh, benefit the, the wider uh, the wider audience but i think the concluding point is 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 is, is the if, if there is a genuine political will to drive the reforms in education sector and if so then how how to ensure that we we collaborate together as one region as kamka region to capitalize on this political will uh, to make sure that our education systems evolve fast enough so that we can provide in quality education and create quality jobs I think uh, with this, uh, I would like to conclude the session, and this concludes the whole Kamka forum of this year. And it's been a particular pleasure and privilege for me to serve uh, you and, and the audience, wider audience as the moderator. And I uh, look forward to our collaboration. Let's drive projects together. Let's really uh, uh, continue this conversation. And the one hour discussion does not do justice to the complexity and the multidimensionality of the question of an education system. And uh, with this, I would like to wholeheartedly thank every panelist for this uh, amazing uh, session and we look forward to our future events. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for moderating. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All the thank best. You. Thank you, Yernar. Thank, thank you, all. Thanks. Thanks.